Welcome to the first lecture of the course, and the topic is population dynamics. In this lecture, we will be looking at what population dynamic is. Part of population dynamics involves discussing factors that play a role in determining the size, density, and distribution of a population. After that, we will be looking at a brief history of human population, uh, looking at how advances in agriculture, technology, science, and medicine allows us as a species to reach a world population of more than 7 billion. Now, um, then we will also examine how we are able to continuously exceed our carrying capacity, which is something that was necessary uh, for us to grow um, exponentially uh, and reach this you know, um, 7 billion uh, population worldwide. The name of the course is human longevity. The word longevity is sometimes used as a synonym for life expectancy. However, the term longevity is sometimes also meant to refer only to a specifically long-lived individual. So I want you to think about the oldest person you know or knew. How old was this person? Or how old is the person if they're still alive? For me, my great-grandmother lived up to 102 years old. And for me, that, that was an you know, astronomical number. It's really, really, really big. Okay? Uh, and, and her daughter, uh, which is my grandmother, um, she is currently um, 93 years old. Uh, and she's actually quite healthy still uh, and mentally alert. So you know, there is still uh, perhaps a long way for her to go. Um, here are some of the longest living person uh, ever recorded. Okay, so you have um, 122 uh, two years old, uh, and sometimes you know they um, they they tie each other, so they so they have to count the days as well. So 122 years, 164 days uh, in in France. That is the oldest uh, ever recorded person, um, and then there is uh, 199 years. Uh, 97 days, and it's kind of tied between uh, Sarah here and uh, Chenyono, uh, which is from uh, uh, Japan. So these are some of the oldest, uh, uh, longest living persons uh, ever recorded. And if you ask them, you know, uh, what's the secret? Well, it depends who you ask, right? Uh, uh, and, and generally speaking, um, people say, you know, uh, live an active life, you know, uh, have a, have a plant-based diet, uh, and, um, you know, avoid smoking and that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, but really, right, there's no consensus as to what, what is the secret formula uh, in, in living to a very, very old age. Um, you can do all the right things and, and still uh, perhaps not be able to live uh, up to hundreds of years of age. And, you know, for some people, uh, it's not just about living to a very old age, right? It's about um, um, living a healthy uh, life as well, right? So, you know, if, if you live at up to hundreds of years of, of, of age, uh, but then, you know, you're battling illnesses uh, for, for, for the later half of your, of your life, um, then, then it might not be a, a meaningful life, uh, as some people would, would argue. The life expectancy in Canada is uh, 82.3 years okay so uh is, is that good is that bad well you know it's all relative right uh um if we rank all the life expectancies of all the countries in the world uh canada ranks about uh 12 uh, on the list so you know not bad not a bad place to be in uh, uh and um if you have to guess uh what country would have the highest life expectancy? What, what do you think the answer is? And so maybe pause the video a little bit uh, and, and, and think about it. If you've guessed Monaco, that would be the correct answer. Okay? Uh, according to uh, um, statistics being collected, uh, Monaco, which is a um, uh, European country, uh, it has the highest life expectancy of 86.75. So, you know, uh, compared to Canada, it's, it's not like a decade longer, uh, but it's still, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, almost six, six years uh, um, uh, more. Uh, and um, if you look at Monaco, um, the population is actually uh, uh, quite small in, in this country. Uh, and it's actually one of the richest country in the entire world with a GDP per capita of $185,000 um, USD. Uh, so that is actually um, quite high. Now think about uh, what the uh, what country would have the lowest life expectancy. Okay, um, 
I mean, rather than naming the specific countries, you might try to think about what region of the world such country uh, would be in. And the answer to that question is Central Africa Republic. And uh, that is a country in Central Africa. Um, and the um, uh, life expectancy in this country is only 52.24. Uh, so compared to 86 years, this is substantially uh, 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 lower. Um, and it's also one of the poorest country um, in the world with a GDP per capita of just 475 US dollars. So um, clearly you can see that there is uh, perhaps a relationship between the, um, the wealth of the country uh, compared to the life expectancy. The GDP per capita is, um, is usually used as an indicator uh, for the uh, standard of livings uh, of the country. So uh, as we can see, uh, for uh, Monaco, which is the one with the highest uh, life expectancy of 86.8 years, um, the GDP per capita is quite, quite high. Uh, compared to Central African uh, Republic, uh, we saw that the GDP per capita is just 475. And as a reference, uh, I put in Canada in this graph uh, for you to see. In Canada, uh, GDP per capita is about uh, 46,000 USD, uh, and we have a life expectancy of 82.3 um, years. So. Perhaps this is not entirely unexpected. Um, if a country has low standard of living, um, then it means its citizens uh, will not have access to things like uh, health care. Um, they might not even have access to basic things like uh, clean water. And, and um, you know, without access to clean water and, and health care, uh, it's uh, understandable why the life expectancy uh, would be quite low uh, in these countries. How do you define life expectancy? The average number of years a newborn is expected to live with current mortality patterns remaining the same. That's basically what life expectancy is. It's just a fancy way of saying how long do you expect a person to live up to, right? Um, and, and the key, key thing here to kind of pay attention to is, is uh, the mortality patterns, okay? So that's, that's basically uh, talking about like reasons, reasons uh, why, an individual, individual uh, will die. Okay, so it could be could be accidents, um, could be you know uh, illnesses, uh, and you know if the reasons why people don't die, uh, pe why people die don't change, um, you know what? How long do you expect this person to live? That's basically uh, life expectancy. Based on what we saw earlier, the life expectancy in the world has a large range ranging from as low as 52 in some developing countries to as high as 86 years in some developed countries. However, despite of such discrepancy, there are actually a few trends related to life expectancy that holds true uh, worldwide. And the first uh, trend that is true uh, for all countries um, is that the life expectancy has been steadily increasing. Uh, you know, here we have data from uh, as early as 1543 to uh, as recent as 2019. And you can see uh, uh, this, this, this purple line here, that's the world uh, life expectancy that has been uh, in a steady increase for the past um, uh, two centuries or so. Uh, and, you know, I just selected a few countries here uh, and you can see, you know, overall, um, as a, as a general trend, um, they, they, are, they are all increasing uh, steadily. Surely there is some uh, dips uh, here and there, but overall uh, the trend is an, is an upward trend. So that, that's the first uh, uh, trend that is um, true for life expectancy uh, on a global level. The second trend uh, related to life expectancy that is true across the globe is the fact that female uh, tend to outlive uh, males. Okay? Women live longer uh, lives than, than men uh, do. Um, and, and as to why that is the case, um, there are several theories um, that try to explain this. And the most uh, commonly accepted theory is that um, there could be some genetic um, 
advantage in in the women's um, uh, genetic makeup compared to the men's. Uh, um, you might or might not know that uh, men are genetically XY, uh, whereas female, they are genetically XX. Uh, and so uh, some theorize that uh, the extra X chromosome in female is offering some kind of uh, advantage when it comes to uh, life expectancy. So this graph is looking very busy, uh, but basically uh, what that means, what you're looking at is um, the various countries uh, which are represented by these um, circle, these bubbles. Uh, and um, uh, this line would mean that the men and the, uh, and the women uh, in that country had the same uh, life expectancy. So, for example, if you if you look at uh, um, this this country at the uh, Bolton, um, the life expectancy between men and females are uh, very similar. Okay, but if as long as the country is above this line, it means in that country, uh, women uh, outlive uh, men. Okay, so the further you are away from the line, uh, then um, the greater the difference um, between the life expectancy of female uh, compared to male in that country. So um, you can see in South Korea uh, over here, it's, it's well above the line, okay? So that means um, the females in that countries outlive the male counterpart by um, almost as much as uh, five to 10 years, okay? Um, uh, and, and, you know, you, you can see the exact numbers by kind of tracking it to, uh, to the bottom and to the side here. Uh, but the key takeaway from this slide is that um, females um, outlive um, male in, um, basically everywhere in the world, as you can tell from this graph. The uh, third trend um, that's uh, holding true related to um, life expectancy on a global scale is that um, there is still a wide discrepancy between um, developed countries and developing countries. Okay, the life expectancy of developed countries uh, tend to be much better compared to those of the developing countries. Okay, so you can see um, here is where most developing countries are, um, and the life expectancy falls uh, within um, the range of 55 to 65, uh, and whereas you know in developed countries. Um, they are sitting well above the 75 uh, year um, cutoff. Okay, so these three trends are uh, summarized um, in in this slide. Okay, so life expectancy is generally increasing uh, for the past few uh, decades around the world. Um, generally, female live longer than males, and there is still a substantial gap uh, remaining between developing countries and developed countries. Now let's talk about what population dynamics is. Population dynamics are changes in population characteristics determined by four things listed here. There is natality, which basically is just another word for birth. Um, there is mortality, which is another word for death. Uh, immigration, uh, people coming into the country, for example. Emigration, people going out of the country. So if we are considering um, global population, uh, then immigration emigration would not apply. Uh, but if we are talking about individual countries, um, then obviously those things would play, uh, play a role. Um, so to calculate the uh, population change for a country, for example, we would add the number of births to the number of immigration. Uh, and that uh, together is going to increase the population size. And we would subtract the death and emigration. Right? Both of these things would decrease the population size. Um, and after we calculate that, we will divide it by the initial population size, multiply it by 100%, and that will give us uh, the percent change for the population. So if you have a percent change that is a positive, okay, so positive percent, that means it is growing. Okay, the population is 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 uh, experiencing growth. Okay, if you have a negative percent change, um, then that means there is a decline, decline in growth. Okay, so the population is actually uh, shrinking. Uh, and if you have zero percent, um, then uh, we call that uh, ZPG. Something we'll talk about later. Uh, this is zero population growth. So the population is neither growing or shrinking. It's just um, stabilized that way. Okay. Um, so four things, natality, mortality, immigration, and emigration. Now, uh, natality, again, birth, uh, it actually depends on two 
uh, concepts. One is core fecundity, the other is core fertility. So fecundity is the potential to produce offspring, okay? whereas uh, fertility is the actual number of offspring produced in an individual's lifetime. Okay, so uh, fecundity is how much, how many uh, offsprings can you uh, produce maximally, okay? Uh, whereas the fertility is the actual number. So uh, here you can see these are these are horseshoe crab. Okay? Horseshoe crabs can lay up to 90,000 eggs in a single spawning season, okay? Um, and um, compared to something like the, the, the Asian elephant uh, here that you see, um, they have the longest gestational period of any animal, almost 22 months. So fecundity in the population can increase and decrease depending on environmental conditions um, and other factors such as uh, food availability, uh, climates, all that can change the uh, potential to reproduce, all that could change the fecundity. Now, in humans, uh, uh, the fertility, how many babies you actually have, is often much lower than uh, fecundity, how many babies you uh, can potentially have. Okay? So even though humans can potentially have, uh, I don't know, you, you hear stories about people having you know, 10, 12 kids or something like that. Uh, 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 so clearly, we can have uh, a lot of offsprings in our lifetime. Uh, but for most of us, we don't. Okay? For most of us, we only have um, perhaps uh, two kids now, nowadays. Okay? So the fertility, the actual number of kids that you have, is much lower than the uh, fecundity. Okay? So here is a chart that shows uh, the number of children um, uh, women has uh, over, uh, over, over, over a period of time. Right? So um, uh, in 1950s, you, know, um, you can look at the world data, the, the average number of kids uh, women had would be around five. So if you just think about uh, like the number of uncles and aunts you have, right? Um, then you, you can kind of see, you know, in previous generations, in our in our grandparents' uh, generations, um, they tend to have, you know, three to four kids, and and, and that's that's quite a common thing to do. Uh, and what happens is, as as time goes on, right, uh, to more recent days, uh, the number of kids people have uh, start to start to go down. Uh, and 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 nowadays, um, most people. Are only have like two or three kids, okay? Uh, and in Canada, um, on average, people have actually um, less than two kids, okay? So um, generally speaking, people have two kids to just kind of replace themselves, right? So you know, when when you and your spouse die and you have two kids, so they they kind of uh, 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 replace you, so to speak, right? Uh, in terms of the population count, okay? So why why is the number of kids? Um, people having a decline over time. Um, again, there are many, many reasons. Uh, um, one possible explanation is uh, the use of birth control uh, and, and women's rights. Um, and people uh, uh, tend to have kids later on in life now uh, uh, because um, you know, of, uh, of a personal choice, uh, because perhaps of their careers, uh, and all those things kind of plays into uh, why um, the number of kids we have um, as a society uh, has been decreasing uh, over time. So uh, that was natality, uh, birth, um, and the opposite of that is, uh, is mortality. Uh, one way to represent death uh, or mortality rate is by using something called the survivorship graph. Okay, so a survivorship graph shows the number of expected survivor at a given age. In other words, how many people are expected to live at a given age? That's what a survivor graph, a survivorship graph is. So typically there are three types of survivorship uh, a graph. We have type one uh, over here shown in red. We have type two shown in blue and type three um, shown in green here. Okay, and the uh, vertical axis shows the number of survivors. Um, it's a logarithmic scale. Uh, if you don't know what that means, it's okay. It's um, not really important um, in, 
in, in, in the context of what we're discussing. Uh, it doesn't change how I explain the graph. Uh, and over here on the x-axis, we have the age in relative units. So this, this is going to be uh, younger, and this is going to be this is going to be older. Okay. So um, type one curves, which is the red one, uh, are relatively flat at the beginning. Uh, this means that there is low death rate in the early and middle years, and then it drops steeply uh, as death increases in their older age group. So human fits type one curves. We produce few offspring, right, as we just discussed in the previous slide, uh, and we provide extended care for our youngs, uh, and and that kind of attention to our uh, to our young ones, uh, that kind of caring to our offsprings uh, is going to help offset juvenile mortality. OK, uh, uh, and, and we make sure that they grow up uh, and it's not until later on in life that the mortality starts to increase. Um, type two curve uh, reflects a relatively constant rate of mortality in all age group. OK, uh, what that means is um, the, the the organism is as likely to die here compared to here. OK, so um, uh, in early on in life or later on in life, it doesn't matter. The probability of death is the same. So many types of bird, they fit this type of um, survivorship graph. Uh, it just means that the um, probability of uh, dying from things like um, predator diseases and starvation uh, is actually the same uh, in all ages. Uh, lastly, we have the type 3 uh, curve, which has a very steep decline at the beginning. Okay? What that means is there is going to be a lot of expected death at a very, very young age. Uh, but once you make past a certain threshold age, um, then the chances of dying is very, very low. Okay, so trees, um, they fit this uh, uh, models very, very nicely. Okay, uh, not all the uh, uh, sprouts are going to survive at the beginning. Okay, but once they reach uh, a, a certain age, right, a certain size uh, later on in life, um, they are there, there to stay for you know hundreds and hundreds of years. Okay, uh, and insects also fit this uh, type of models. So if you think about, I don't know, like spiders or something, they have thousands and thousands of eggs, okay? Uh, and, and, you know, not all of them are going to hatch. And, and if they hatch, not all of them are going to make it, right? But for those that make it, um, they are going to live uh, for, uh, for quite some time. And, you know, that's kind of the reason why they have so many offsprings, right? Because they know well, I mean, not like consciously know, but then, but then they know that uh, not all the offsprings are going to make it, right? Uh, and so uh, they are going to have a lot of them. Uh, hopefully, some of them will make it. Uh, and for those that make it, they will survive to, um, to, to, uh, to an older age. Okay, so there you have it. Three types of survivorship graphs um, that depict different uh, uh, mortality rates uh, at different age. So uh, we have been talking about population change, and here is a, here is a sample question. Okay? Um, if the population of a country in 2018 was this particular number, uh, we are going to use the data to calculate the, the uh, population change for this, uh, for this country. So it's uh, quite straightforward. Okay? So the formula is, uh, is up here. So percent change, percent change is going to be uh, birth minus uh, birth plus immigration. So this is going to be 383,315, right? Birth plus immigration plus 240763. And we will be subtracting, subtracting uh, death and emigration. So 266161 plus 65837. And we will take all that and divide it by the initial population, 375,89262. Okay, 37,589,262. Okay, and then we're going to multiply this by 100%. And you just plug this into the calculator and you should get 0.777%. Okay, so um, this particular country in the year uh, 2018 to 2019, um, the population change is 0.777%. So it's experiencing some growth, okay, not a lot of growth, uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's a positive number. Um, so there is going to be some growth expected in this country. 
Now, uh, what kind of factors affect population growth? There are generally two categories uh, when it comes to discussing what factors affect population growth. There are the density uh, dependent factors. Okay, so first of all, if you don't um, uh, not familiar if you're not familiar with the concept of density uh, let's say this is this is a particular country uh, or, or you can just think of a particular um, uh, area okay uh, if you have a lot of individuals in that area okay then this is high high density okay uh, and if you have the same area but now you have fewer individuals then this would be this would be low low density Okay, so some factors are density dependent factors, which means the specific factor that we're talking about is going to have greater impact on the population growth as the population density increases or decreases. Okay, now uh, it just states that the impact is going to be greater when the population density changes. It doesn't really tell you uh, what direction it is. Okay, for example, uh, things like competition competition for like resources, shelter, uh, uh, mate, that kind of stuff, um, diseases, uh, okay, I have competition again, <laughs> let's just ignore that, uh, and crowding, uh, all these are going to be worse when the density is higher, okay? So, uh, you know, now now we're exper experiencing um, a pandemic, right? You can appreciate that. The uh, disease is going to spread quicker when the uh, population is denser, right? That's why we have the social distancing thing, right? We keep away from each other uh, um, to kind of artificially lower the density in that respect, right? So these things are going to be worse uh, when the density of the population is higher. Now, um, it's not always going to be worse when the uh, population is uh, higher density. Uh, there is something called the alley effect, uh, and, and that is something that actually is going to be worse uh, when the population density is low. Okay, So the alley effect states that when a population uh, reaches a critically low size, then the population will not be able to survive uh, uh, because they're going to fail to reproduce enough to offset mortality. Basically, it means if the population size is small enough, then there won't be enough individuals to reproduce uh, to give rise to new individuals in the population. Uh, and then you have more individuals dying uh, in the population than are born. Uh, and as a result, uh, you're going to have negative growth. Uh, and if that continues for several generations, um, this could increase the risk of, uh, of extinction. Okay, So um, this is an example where it kind of goes the other way. When the density is quite low, the effect uh, is, um, is um, more detrimental. So on the other hand, we have factors uh, that are density independent, Okay, which means it doesn't matter uh, how dense the population is, it doesn't matter how scarce the population is, um, these kind of things would affect them all the same. Um, so example of that would be things like pollution, uh, climate change, natural catastrophe. So if you think about having a, a, an earthquake or something, it doesn't matter if there are uh, 10,000 individuals in the, in the area or a million individuals in that area, uh, the catastrophe would affect them, would have the same uh, detrimental effect uh, on both populations. So uh, population growth, um, even under ideal situations, okay, if, if there is lots of food and, uh, you know, no diseases and people are able to uh, live healthily uh, and, and, and reproduce, and have offsprings, even under the ideal situations, uh, population growth is not going to be um, indefinite, okay? So you cannot keep on growing and growing and growing. Uh, and that's because at any given time, there is a limit to the number of individuals the environment can support. And this limit is called the carrying capacity, okay? Carrying capacity. So let's, let's you know, hypothetically speaking, there is a, there is a big island, okay? And, uh, and there's gonna be, um, you know, a lot of carrots growing on this island, for example, okay? And uh, the only thing that lives on this island 
is going to be uh, to be some uh, rabbits, okay, some bunnies, okay. So these bunnies would have no competition, okay. They would have a lot of food, so they would eat the food, and then they would they would have babies, okay. They would have more bunnies, okay. And then the population would just keep on growing, growing, growing. In fact, for something like this, the population population over time is expected to grow exponentially, exponentially, okay. But what happens is there is going to be a point where there are so many, so many rabbits, so many bunnies in the island that they are eating the carrots faster than uh, they can grow. And so eventually the population is going to uh, be starving okay? because there is not enough food to go around. So that is the carrying capacity okay, uh, of the island, which means eventually the population will grow, will slow down. And it will hit some kind of, of of ceiling, so to speak. Okay, so that ceiling is K, uh, which is uh, carrying capacity. So uh, to define it better, the carrying capacity is the maximum number of organisms that can be sustained by available resources over a limited period of time. Okay, so back to our island with the rabbits, right? If you give them sufficient uh, amount of time, then sure, the carrots is going to grow back. Uh, but um, when we discuss carrying capacity, we are talking about a limited period of time. Um, it's important to also know that carrying capacity is not a fixed number. Okay, it's a, it's a dynamic number uh, because the environment is always changing. Okay, so uh, you know maybe there is a, is a, another food source available on the island. Okay, so maybe some of the rabbits they change to eating. I don't know what else they eat. They change to eat like celery or something. Uh, and there is an alternate uh, food source, right? And that would change the carrying capacity. Okay, so it's not fixed. Uh, a fixed number, uh, and as we will see later on in the lecture, uh, humans have found ways to exceed the carrying capacity again and again, uh, which has allowed us to uh, to not reach the carrying capacity uh, and continue to grow um, as a, as a species. So this is a graph, uh, a nicer graph that I showed you. So if you start off with a few individuals, uh, uh, a small population, not so small that you're going to see the Ali effect, okay? But you know, uh, 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 a small enough population that's able to grow. Um, at the beginning, um, they would experience what what's called a lag phase, okay? So so they are growing, but uh, the growth, it's not very uh, rapid, okay? Um, because there are a limited number of individuals in the population. Uh, they are not going to be able to create as many offsprings. But once you reach a, a threshold population, a critical uh, a population size, then all of a sudden, you're gonna, the population is going to enter the log phase, okay? So this is the phase where there is very, very rapid growth, uh, and the population size increases um, exponentially. Okay? But eventually, as the population uh, uh, um, nears the carrying capacity uh, of the regions they're in, uh, then, this, then the growth is going to slow. Okay? And eventually, you are going to uh, 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 be capped at the carrying capacity, uh, and we call that the uh, stationary phase. So a population at the stationary phase is actually uh, quite uh, vulnerable. Um, because uh, 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 if, it, if it exceeds the carrying capacity, uh, then there is going to be uh, an inadequate uh, resource avail available, uh, not just food source, right, but things like shelters and stuff like that, uh, and, and that could actually cause the uh, population to plummet, okay, to go down uh, sharply. Okay, uh, it, it might not plummet. Um, it might just oscillate uh, around the uh, carrying capacity, uh, but. Nevertheless, this is not a very ideal situation for the population. You do not want to be uh, hovering at the carrying capacity. Okay, it's very, very unstable. So uh, there was a, a, a famous uh, English uh, cleric, scholar, and influential economist. Uh, his name was Thomas uh, Malthus, and uh, he um, uh, published a paper uh, called the Essay on the Principle of Population. Okay? This was published in uh, 17, 1798, uh, I think. Um, and, and basically, uh, Malthus, he observed that uh, an increase in the nation's food production will improve the well-being of the population. 
but the improvement was only temporary because with increased resources, it also led to an increase in population growth, which then uh, subsequently would restore the original uh, per capita production level. Okay, um, so you know what does that mean? This graph basically summarizes uh, what I've just said. It's probably a little bit easier to follow. Um, so according to Mathis, basically um, food source, food supply, uh, which is shown in blue here, is linear growth. Okay, so linear, we are talking about, for example, like two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, right? So we uh, we are adding two at a time, right? This is called linear growth. Whereas uh, population growth, which is shown here in red, is going to be uh, exponential, exponential growth. Okay, so exponential is much faster, right? Um, it starts off slow, but then it picks up and increase quite rapidly. So this is like um, two, four, uh, and then eight, 16, 32, 64, right? So instead of adding a fixed amount each cycle, we are multiplying by a fixed uh, number each time. So exponential growth is much more rapid compared to linear growth, right? So um, um, there is this concept of Malthusian trap, okay? And, and the trap is basically talking about um, we are currently in, um, in, in this, this area here, and uh, it is inevitable that we are heading towards, uh, we are going to be heading towards a point where the uh, population growth is going to be exceeding the food supply. Okay, so uh, the fact that we are heading towards that point, uh, that's called the Malthusian trap. Okay, and once you've hit that point, right, uh, beyond that, the population would grossly exceed the uh, food supply that's being available. Uh, and that's what he called the Malthusian um, catastrophe. Okay, so once you've reached the Malthusian uh, catastrophe, then uh, there won't be enough resources to go around and the population will be forced to uh, to live at a subsistence level uh, condition. Okay, uh, In other words, you will only be able to uh, uh, live a life uh, with minimal amount of resources that will keep you alive. Okay, So that, that's what the uh, catastrophe is. So again, the trap is talking about the fact that we are heading towards that point. Uh, and the catastrophe is when it actually happens. Okay, so he predicted that would that would happen uh, at the turn of the century, um, but uh, but it didn't. Okay, uh, and and part of the reason uh, why it didn't happen is because we were able to um, rely on several uh, uh, innovations uh, as a as a human species to increase the carrying capacity, and so we evaded the Malthusian catastrophe. Okay. Uh, but of course, as he correctly uh, predict, with more resources, the population is just going to grow. So um, are we delaying the, in the inevitable or uh, have we find a way to kind of permanently avoid it? Okay. Uh, and, and that's something that we're going to discuss uh, for the remainder of the lecture. So what is the carrying capacity for human population? Well, it actually varies from less than a billion people to more than one trillion people. It really depends on who you are asking and you know what kind of study you're looking at. And, and it also depends on how carrying capacity is defined, right? So some view carrying capacity is uh, limited by food only, but other, uh, other people include uh, resources as well. So, uh, 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 there are other things to consider, right? Uh, people don't just, you know, live with bare minimum amount of resources. If we all do uh, live with bare minimum amount of resources, then there will be plenty to go around in this world, right? But, uh, you know, we, unfortunately, uh, uh, many people um, have more, way more resources uh, uh, in this world than others. Uh, and uh, we also have certain standard of living that we would like to maintain, right, in many parts of the world. Uh, and so if, if everybody um, have to have all these basic things, uh, plus the extra things to have a good uh, standard of living, uh, then the carrying capacity is going to be much lower compared to if everybody is just living at basic uh, subsistence level, right? So trying to uh, uh, um, 
uh, determine the true carrying capacity is actually uh, quite hard right, to, 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 to define as human populations. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, there are various factors that would alter the, the, the true meaning, okay? uh, standard of living, uh, quality of life, as well as longevity. Um, that might change how we define uh, carrying capacity. Okay, uh, if everybody just want to live to uh, 50 or 60 years old, right, then the carrying capacity might be higher. But if we all try to live to 86 or 90 years old with good health and everything, then that takes much much more resources um, to achieve that. There is something called the Earth Overshoot Day. Uh, the Earth Overshoot Day marks the date when humanity's annual demand on natural resources exceeds what the Earth's ecosystem can regenerate in that year. Okay, so basically it means uh, in, two, uh, in the year 2020, this year, um, on August 22nd, uh, we have consumed all the natural resources um, that the Earth was able to regenerate uh, uh, this year. Okay, so the year before, 2019, um, the overshoot day was um, July 29th, so um, we, we've improved a little bit, okay? The later the day, the better, okay? Um, the best would mean that it's going to be, uh, you know, December 31st uh, or something. That means uh, uh, throughout the whole year, right, we only use as much as the Earth is able to regenerate uh, within, within that year. So there is a video here. You can click on the link uh, to, to watch it. Uh, it kind of explains to you um, what Earth Overshoot Day uh, is and you know the kind of things that you can do to help push the day uh, to, a, to a later date in the year. So here is a, a history of uh, the Earth Overshoot date from 1970 to 2019. So back in, back in 1970, right, uh, it, it was uh, uh, almost uh, uh, at the end of the, um, of the calendar year, right? Uh, 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 you know, December, and then uh, it, it's not until later in December that we reach the uh, Earth Overshoot Day, right? So if, if every year uh, the Earth Overshoot Day is on December 31st, um, then we are going to be able to live sustainably, right? Uh, and of course, even better would be to, to not reach that day uh, at all in a calendar year. That means we, as humanity, consume less resources uh, than the Earth is able to regenerate within that year. So what happens is um, between 1970 to 2019, um, that day has been kept on uh, uh, pushing earlier and earlier and earlier. Uh, and you can see for the past um, decade or so, right, uh, the day is around uh, September uh, to August. Okay, so um, you know if this day move all the way to uh, to February or January, uh, then then we'll be in trouble. Okay, that means we are rapidly depleting the resources of uh, of these uh, of this planet. Now, um, so that that's Earth Overshoot Day, uh, considering the planet as a whole. Um, there is something called Country Overshoot Day, uh, and you know it's really really small here. Uh, you might not be able to see the details uh, in the uh, in the videos, uh, but you know in the PowerPoint slides you can you can zoom in and, and take a closer look. Um, so uh, this is kind of interesting. Um, it means uh, if everybody live like uh, Canada, okay, if if all the countries in the world use as much resource resources as Canada, uh, then the Earth Overshoot Day would happen uh, as early as March 18. Okay, so. Uh, what that means is Canada, compared to the rest of the world, we actually use much more, more resources. Uh, and, 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 and that's why if everybody lived like us, then we would exhaust the um, uh, resource much earlier uh, than the Earth is able to renew uh, at that year. Now, let's take a look at the uh, bottom of the list here, right, for some of the, uh, uh, you know, poorer countries uh, uh, like uh, Ecuador here and Indonesia, if everybody live uh, like the country uh, uh, Indonesia, um, then the Earth Overshoot Day would occur at December 18th, okay, much, much, much later, right? So um, that speaks to what we were talking about uh, earlier with carrying capacity, right? Um, 
that varies depends on how we define the standard of living okay if everybody is living uh, 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 like a Luxembourg right uh, then the carrying capacity is going to be quite low right because everybody's using so much resources right but if everybody's living uh, 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 like people uh, uh, lower on the list right in these countries um, then the carrying capacity is going to be much higher uh, because we're not demanding as much resources okay so this is an interesting concept that ties into uh, carrying capacity uh, this is another way to look at the data uh, uh, for example if everybody lives like uh, people in uh, uh, the United States uh, how many earth do we actually need to uh, to sustain uh, this kind of level of activity it turns out we would need uh, five five earths right so five earths worth of resources to to have a standard of living uh, uh, like uh, USA for everybody in the whole world right so clearly uh, that is not sustainable okay and compared to something uh, somewhere like India uh, if everybody require as much resources as um, the country India um, then there, we would only require 0.7 uh, of the earth okay so obviously uh, these data there are a lot of assumptions uh, built within it uh, you know it's it's not 100% accurate I would argue uh, but nevertheless is a uh, it's a um, you know it's a good way to to kind of put things into perspective uh, and to see uh, uh, you know the different countries compared to uh, to each other so next we're gonna uh, shift gear and uh, look at the brief history of human uh, population growth um, you know we didn't always have seven billions uh, human beings roaming around uh, uh, on the earth uh, in fact human population has grown quite slowly for most of its existence on earth um, scientists currently estimated that modern human beings uh, evolved roughly uh, 130,000 years to 160,000 years ago um, and you know when when human populations were just starting uh, there were many threats uh, from diseases to climate fluctuations um, and, and those kind of things have kept life expectancy short and death rates uh, high uh, especially in uh, in pre-industrial society so it took until uh, 1804 uh, around 1804 so um, uh, 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 around that time uh, for human population to 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 reach 1 billion okay and from that point on uh, population growth has accelerated very very quickly uh, if you remember the um, the graph I showed you earlier right with the uh, with the population uh, growth uh, it started off uh, quite slow and then there is the lock phase and then there is the plateau right so once we've reach the 1 billion landmark uh, um, uh, population uh, we have since then been entering the the log phase of growth okay so you can see uh, the population is going up 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 uh, quite rapidly now the question that we're trying to assess here is will we will we be heading towards the stationary phase anytime soon uh, or you know we still have a long way to go Okay. Uh, and certainly based on the information I we looked at right with the earth overshoot day and uh, and the resources availability um, it seems that it seems that we might be we might be heading towards the uh, the plateau phase um, but uh, maybe not right uh, and uh, we're going to uh, examine this in the next few slides so uh, when I first started teaching this course, uh, which was uh, 2017, uh, I uh, look at the world population back then. It was uh, seven point, uh, almost 7.5 billion people. Okay, and um, that was um, on April uh, 2017. Um, and you can go to this website; uh, it, they update it, you know, continuously um, to estimate the world population. And again, uh, clearly there are assumptions, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's not necessarily you know to the dot accurate uh, but it's a, it's a ballpark figure right uh, and you know I just looked this up uh, before I did the recording of, uh, of this um, of this lecture um, so the population uh, in November 2020 is uh, 7.8 million 
okay? A billion, rather, 7.8 billion, okay? So uh, between um, April 2017 and November uh, 2020, uh, the difference in population, it's um, about 323 million uh, extra uh, human beings right, on, this, on this planet, okay? So at this rate, we will hit, we will hit 8 billion uh, very, very soon. So, uh, you know, Manthus talked about how population is going to exceed the food supply, right? And he predicted it was going to be happening at the turn of the century, uh, but it but it never did, and it hasn't occurred yet. Um, so why is that the case? Well, um, there are three ways that uh, humans was able to exceed the carrying capacity, okay? Uh, and, and we're going to examine, you know, each of these uh, different ways. So first, um, we as a, as a species, we were able to expand our geographic range. Um, we were able to domesticate plants and animals um, to increase food sources. Uh, and there were um, the science and technology revolution. Uh, and, and, you know, the science and the technology aspect is still actually going on, right? There are still many scientific breakthrough and technological breakthrough nowadays. Um, and all of these are going to be able to uh, extend the human uh, 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 life expectancy, okay? So let's take a look at these things at a closer, take, take a close look at these things. Um, first, expand geographic range. Um, early human ancestors lived in tropicals and subtropical uh, uh, grassland, and uh, by about 40,000 years ago, um, our human ancestor had basically dispersed uh, throughout much of the world, uh, and that was possible uh, through discovery of fires, the use of tools to make shelters and clothing, we are no longer limited to uh, uh, one geographic location, okay? Uh, because we're able to make our own shelter, to make clothing, to adapt to different uh, uh, climates, uh, right? Colder temperatures, for example, um, humans, be, human beings, our ancestors are were able to uh, uh, spread to uh, virtually all corners of the world, uh, and that drastically removed competition for space as well as for resources. Now, the next big thing uh, that really helped with the human population boom uh, was the domestication of plants and animals. Okay, so approximately uh, 10,000 years to 12,000 years ago, uh, people began planting seeds to grow food. Um, Nobody really know exactly uh, when this happened, but you know, based on uh, Evidence, fossil evidence, for example, is suggested that the idea of cultivating crops developed slowly over thousands of years. Okay, so what we do know is that the event of agriculture drastically changed the course of human existence. Uh, many of the same food that we eat today actually were amount of first to be farmed uh, by our um, early ancestor. Uh, for example, things like wheat and oaks were planted in Asia about. Uh, uh, 10,500 years ago, um, and corn, for example, uh, was likely first cultivated in regions um, that is now known as, um, as Mexico, uh, roughly about uh, 10,000 years ago. And, and rice, which is, as you may know, a staple in many diets today, uh, was first farmed at about 9,000 years ago. Okay, so the ability to plant and to uh, domesticate animals, uh, that uh, drastically increased uh, food supply. Um, and of course, uh, with increased food supply, uh, we were able to uh, push the, the, the carrying capacity uh, higher, right? And, and that uh, uh, follows a, a greater population uh, growth increase. With the domestication of plants and animals, populations were transformed from small mobile groups of hunters and gatherers into societies in permanent villages and towns. Uh, people in these permanent communities were able to modify their natural environment through uh, things like irrigation and specialized crop cultivation. Uh, and these practices have led to development of food storage practices and technologies, uh, which resulted in surplus of food production. And with surplus of food, uh, the population was able to grow uh, quite rapidly. Uh, in fact, populations with large agricultural food surpluses were able to spread out around the world, uh, taking with them their domesticated animals, plants, and other technological advancement. Um, for example, European settlers brought many plants and animals, including um, wheat, barley, and horses, 
uh, cattle and pigs uh, to North America. Um, however, not everything that the European settlers brought with them was beneficial to the indigenous people. Um, European diseases declimated uh, Abor Aboriginal populations, um, and, and guns provided the Europeans with immediate military superiority, um, and their centralized form of government uh, was so different from the Aboriginal form of government, um, and that promoted institutions uh, that controlled and took place uh, of the sustainable Aboriginal ways of life. So um, not everything was uh, uh, necessarily positive. Uh, there was some uh, negative aspect of, uh, of you know, uh, spreading uh, uh, too quickly around the world uh, as well. As the population size increases, so does the population density. Uh, and as we learned earlier, one of the density dependent factors are diseases. So uh, what happens is um, now that we have a, a, a more dense uh, population, um, diseases are able to spread easier. Uh, in fact, many of the diseases that have significantly reduced local populations, uh, we, we call those endemics, um, are believed to have been diseases of domestic uh, animals that later evolved into diseases that could infect humans. So because of the practice of domestication, um, now humans are living in close proximity with, uh, with the animals, uh, and that gave it a chance uh, for them to catch the diseases um, from the animals. So common diseases like measles, tuberculosis, and smallpox um, were thought to originate from, uh, from cattle. Uh, while things like um, uh, flu and pertussis, um, they were thought to have originated from, uh, from pigs. Um, as well as uh, uh, ducks in the case of, uh, of flus, right? You might remember hearing about the bird flu, right? So uh, that originated from, uh, from, from chickens. So uh, uh, that is certainly an unintended uh, consequences of um, animal domestication. When it comes to the spread of diseases, there are typically three levels of severity. Okay, so we have the uh, least severe severe kind, uh, which is what we call uh, an endemic. Okay, so endemic is a disease that exists permanently in a particular region or a population. So an example of uh, an endemic would be uh, would be malaria. Okay, so malaria is uh, prevalent in uh, some country in some regions, um, uh, but it's not a it's not a worldwide problem. It's not something that exists in many regions of the world. Uh, only a certain localized region. Um, so for that reason, we call it an endemic. Uh, and an epidemic um, is an outbreak of a disease that attacks many people at about the same time, um, and this has spread um, through one or several uh, communities um, around the region. Uh, and an example of that would be the, um, the Ebola outbreak uh, that occurred um, in 2017-2018. Uh, uh, and of course, now we are experiencing a, a pandemic okay, with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which is basically a, a disease that spreads uh, throughout the world. Okay, So uh, listed here are the um, increase in severity of um, the, the number of individuals being affected uh, by the by the disease, okay, with pandemic being the worst and endemic being the most most localized. Okay, so uh, throughout the history of mankind, there had been many different um, endemic, uh, many different pandemics, um, and uh, some are worse than others. Um, so Black Death uh, was the worst. Uh, uh, pandemics uh, in the uh, in the human history is the most devastating uh, pandemics in human history, um, resulting in uh, deaths of um, estimated of 75 to 200 uh, million people. Okay, so uh, Black Death actually uh, spread from China to Europe in the 14th centuries. Uh, and just to put that into perspective, um, COVID-19 so far, as of the day of recording. Uh, has caused um, uh, around 1.2 million deaths uh, worldwide. Um, so compared to Black Death, which has caused uh, up to an estimate of 200 million people uh, uh, died from that. Um, it's uh, it's quite 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 bad um, uh, when it comes to Black Death. It was so bad that uh, if you look at the uh, uh, graph that shows the human population growth, um, that you see a little little blip here that goes down. Um, that that's caused by uh, Black Death, okay, uh, and you know it reduced the population um, quite significantly uh, when it occurred. 
So number three, um, the third way is that um, we kind of increase our carrying capacity uh, and uh, allows the human population to boom um, has to do with science and technology uh, revolution. So in the 17th uh, century, science-based knowledge and technology started to become major influencing factors in European societies. Um, notably, there was the cell theory uh, and the germ theory. Uh, in biology, and that kind of provided the foundation for modern medicine. Um, the cell theory uh, basically is the discovery um, that um, all living things is made up of cells, um, and the germ theory uh, is uh, uh, a theory that states that many disease causing uh, uh, many diseases are actually caused by uh, microorganisms. Okay, so once they've uh, identified the source of the illnesses. Um, they were able to, you know, find the appropriate uh, cure uh, and, and treatment for uh, many of the illnesses. So uh, advances in chemistry and physics uh, would later permit the harnessing and conversion of fossil fuel energy into mechanical energy, um, and 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 with the uh, um, uh, with that discovery, that resulted in the industrial revolution in the 18th uh, century, uh, and. You know, with the availability of of uh, of, of power and energy um, that actually have uh, drive the manu manufacturing sector uh, quite significantly, uh, resulting in mass production of both industrial and uh, consumer goods. Um, so there is going to be a video on industrial revolution that I will post um, online um, that you can take a look um, at a later time. Uh, furthermore, um, uh, there were other breakthrough in, breakthroughs in chemistry, uh, which has uh, led to the production of uh, many new compounds, uh, including fertilizers. Um, and with the development of fertilizers, now we can produce food uh, 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 even at greater capacity than before, right? So um, that has further increased the carrying capacity uh, substantially. So. Um, as time goes on, death rates continue to drop uh, with improved access to safe drinking water, uh, sewage system, and development and widespread of uh, use of vaccines. Uh, all of these things have substantially reduced the mortality rate. Um, and with the development of vaccines, uh, that has significantly uh, reduced um, the number of deaths uh, that occur in, uh, in, uh, in child. Uh, uh, and that uh, actually uh, have boosted the overall uh, population growth um, uh, significantly. Uh, and science and technology also allows humans to um, sidestep the uh, natural limits to growth that have existed for millions um, of years for the reasons that I've mentioned. Um, and by the mid 20th century, um, humans had what seems like unlimited access to energy, water, food, and minimal resources. Now, uh, even though mm, many parts of the world have now uh, uh, been transformed into a fully post-industrialized uh, uh, society, uh, but in many parts of the world, uh, basic things like access to clean water uh, is still not available. So it's estimated that worldwide, um, 780 million people still do not have access to improved water source. Okay, so uh, if you don't have a separate source uh, 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 for drinking water. Uh, from where the uh, sewage water is, uh, a lot of times in this part of the world, it's it's the same place, and people would get sick uh, from uh, waterborne uh, diseases, right? Um, and it is estimated that 2.5 billion people lack access to improved uh, sanitation, uh, and that accounts for more than 35 percent of world's uh, population. So, you know, um, there is still many things to be to be done uh, in, in in developing countries um, to bring it. Uh, uh, to a level where um, we would be able to improve life expectancies in those countries substantially. Uh, and one of the people who is trying to solve these uh, kind of problems is, uh, is Bill Gates. Um, so the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, one of the projects that they found that they are funding um, is to basically uh, develop a, a, a self a contained a toilet system. So in many parts, uh, 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 in, in, in these countries where um, basic sewage treatment plants are not uh, non-existent, uh, what happens is their uh, sewage will go directly back into the drinking 
uh, uh, water source without uh, any any treatment. So um, that has led to uh, a prevalent spread of many waterborne diseases. Um, and so what Bill Gates has done is he 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 funded uh, uh, innovators um, to to design a, a self-contained toilet. Uh, basically, the toilet is going to um, take care of the sewage uh, before emptying the emptying the content uh, uh, you know into uh, into either like a dry powder form or they would be able to burn it uh, for for fuels for example uh, and and you know so so like in 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 uh, in Western society I guess uh, uh, all the waste uh, sewage waste actually go get treated as centralized uh, uh, treatment plan, right? But um, it's too expensive for these um, developing countries in some time, some cases to to have that kind of centralized uh, treatment plan. Uh, and so developing these kind of uh, self-contained toilets uh, would be uh, a much more uh, feasible solutions. Um, and, you know, if you're interested in um, learning more about that, uh, you can just search up this uh, title on Google uh, and you will be able to um, to read up on it. So uh, modern medicines had uh, also dramatically reduced our rates of mortality uh, um, significantly um, in the area of infectious disease. Um, so with the invention of antibiotics, for example, which is something that we will learn about uh, in the coming lectures, um, that has allowed us to um, overcome uh, basic infections right, uh, caused, by, caused by bacteria. Um, and the uh, greatest effect was on death rate of very young uh, uh, people who, um, before the advances in, in medicine, uh, if they become ill at a very young age, right, they are not going to be able to uh, to to make it. Uh, there is no treatment available for them, uh, and so with all these advances, the human population explosion was underway, um, with the population doubling about every uh, 50, 50 years. So now let's uh, take a look at uh, the human uh, demographics um, in relation um, to everything that we've uh, we've talked about. So here uh, it's a graph that shows uh, the global growth rate. Okay, so if we take an average of um, all the growth rate uh, of different countries and then we, we plot it on a graph, right? Uh, uh, this is what it looks like. So uh, the global uh, population growth rate has peaked long time ago. Okay? According to the chart, it shows that the global population growth reached a peak in around um, 1962 and 1963. Okay? You can see over here. Uh, and the growth rate back then was 2.2%. But since then, as you can see, um, the growth rate, the global growth rate, um, has been has been on a decline. Okay, uh, And, you know, in... Um, in, in, in 2020, uh, the growth rate is somewhere around 1.1%. Uh, okay, so based on this, you can see human population is in fact not growing exponentially, as predicted, you know, by uh, by Manthus. Um, in order for this to be uh, an exponential growth rate, um, the the rate would have to be constant over time. Uh, but you can see the rate actually declined from 2.2 to almost half of what 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 it was. Uh, in, in recent years. So there has been some uh, slowing in the growth rate over time. Um, and uh, if the uh, trend continues, right, the blue line here, you can see um, this blue line, it's a prediction of what the growth rate uh, might be in the next, you know, uh, 80 years or, or so, okay? But, you know, this trend might not hold, right? Uh, uh, you know, it could very well um, uh, continue steady at this rate. Um, or I, I personally don't think and, and hope we're not going to reach a growth rate uh, of, of close to zero. OK, uh, uh, but, um, you know, if, if the trend holds true, uh, that's certainly where we are heading. So if you take a look at this uh, uh, world map, OK, it, it shows you the growth rate uh, actually has very uh, uh, very different numbers uh, depending on which country you're talking about. So comparing to uh, the life expectancy uh, graph that we saw earlier, you know, you can pull that up again. Uh, it's it's a similar trend, okay? But uh, uh, over here, you can see developed countries uh, often have lower growth rates, okay? Uh, the green is zero to one percent growth rate, uh, and in developing countries, um, that's where you have high growth rate. Okay, so uh, 
it's almost like an opposite trend here. Okay, in developed countries, you have high growth rates, uh, but the uh, mortality rate is also quite high, uh, resulting in lower life expectancy. Whereas in developed countries, um, you have a low uh, population growth rate, uh, and combine that with um, uh, a low mortality rate, um, you have a population that has uh, longer life expectancy. So uh, the government collects uh, population data uh, using a census, uh, and uh, you know when you receive the census in the in the mail, uh, it is actually the law um, that you have to you have to complete it. Okay, so if you if you don't complete your census, um, you can. You know, actually get fined uh, or even um, uh, face jail time uh, if you um, if you you know stubbornly refuse uh, many times when they when they urge you to um, to complete it. So uh, the census data, one of the things we can uh, extract from the data is to create something called a population pyramid. Um, a population pyramid is a tool that shows the distribution of ages among um, the male and the females in the population. Uh, and, and males are typically shown on the left with females shown on the right. Um, and the graph is divided into um, three, uh, three zones, okay? So we have the pre-reproductive age, the reproductive age, and the post-reproductive age. So here is what uh, a typical population pyramid looks like. Okay, so you, you have the males on the left side, females on the right side, uh, and here are the three um, groups that I was talking about. You have the pre-reproductive uh, years, the reproductive years, as well as the uh, post-reproductive year. Okay, so again, the age, um, the, the population pyramid is um, is a way to uh, represent age distribution across um, the population. Okay, uh, it's basically like a horizontal uh, uh, bar graph. Okay, now if you look at the pyramid, um, we uh, uh, we typically kind of ignore the uh, the top top portion here. Okay, um, these are individuals in the population that have uh, passed the reproductive years uh, in their life. Uh, what that means is they will not be able to contribute to the population uh, growth anymore. Okay, so if we want to use the population pyramid to figure out whether the population is growing or shrinking, right, we would be looking at primarily um, the uh, pre-reproductive years individuals. Okay, so these are the people who are going to reach reproductive age, and they are the ones who are going to have 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 kids. Basically, if you have a a Y base in the pyramid, then that means uh, that population is going to be experiencing rapid growth. Okay, uh, the narrower the base, then the slower the growth is going to be. Okay, so there is going to be a point where uh, it, it's going to be appearing somewhat rectangular uh, in in shape, right? Uh, and and that's a sign that the population is not growing at all. Right, we have zero growth. Right, so we talk about CPG before zero population growth. Um, so this would be a stabilized uh, a population. Uh, and if you have fewer pre, uh, fewer individuals in the pre-reproductive uh, age group compared to the rest of the population, then you kind of have an inverted triangle, right? Like an upside-down triangle, uh, upside-down pyramid, um, and that is indication that uh, your population is going to be experiencing uh, negative growth rate, okay? Because you are not going to have enough uh, 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 individuals in the in the in the base population in the pre-reproductive uh, population to um, to to create new individuals in, in, in the population, basically. So uh, this is what the um, population pyramid looks like in uh, in Canada uh, in 2018, uh, and 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 you know based on the shape, you can see again it's it's relatively relatively um, rectangular in shape in the bottom right, and even um, look a little bit inverted. So uh, based on this, Canada is. Um, perhaps uh, not really growing in terms of size, okay? So uh, we, we would say no growth in this one, no growth, okay? Uh, whereas uh, Japan, uh, for example, uh, is, is somewhat uh, look like an inverted uh, pyramid here, right? 
uh, and so this is actually uh, negative growth, negative growth, okay? Um, and these are just the um, uh, population size uh, uh, of the country uh, uh, in the respective year. So, you know, 37.59 million people in uh, Canada in 2018, and then 126.8 million people in, um, in Japan. Uh, India here, right? You can see uh, this is, this is uh, uh, growth, right? Growth, this shape is corresponding to the growth graph. Okay, a lot of people in India. Uh, and uh, in in Kenya, right, you can see this is very sharp increase. Okay, you have a very wide base compared to the rest of the uh, population. Um, so this is rapid, rapid growth. Okay, so you should you should be able to tell me which graph corresponds to what type of um, of uh, of growth uh, or decline uh, when I ask you that on the uh, on the test. So population growth and economic developments. Um, we use something called the uh, demographic transition model to describe um, historical changes in demographic patterns uh, in the industrialized countries of Western uh, Europe. Now, we don't know if this model is accurate um, in predicting the futures of the currently uh, developing nations, uh, but it, it's a model that was based on uh, countries that has gone through the different phases of industrialization. According to this model, during a country's pre-industrial stage, uh, and that's over here, the birth and death rates are actually quite high. Okay, so both birth rates and death rates of the populations are quite high, uh, and because of that, the population growth is uh, population growth is quite slow. Um, and then industrialization begins a transitional stage, uh, and and that is shown here in green. Uh, and that transition starts to occur when food production rises and healthcare and sanitization improve. Um, and as you learned earlier, improvements in public health reduces uh, death rates, um, causing the population to grow rapidly. Okay, so you can see uh, uh, once you enter the transitional stage, then uh, the population growth kind of enters the, uh, the log phase that we've discussed uh, earlier. Uh, then, however, the, uh, the cost of supporting a larger family uh, actually discourages parents to have uh, as many children. So the birth rate will decline as you shift towards the uh, end of the transitional stage. Okay, it's expensive to feed all the people in the family. So now you get they're, they're going to have a, a less number of kids, right? And we saw that earlier with the um, with the natality graph, right? Uh, people used to have five, six, seven, five, six kids, and, and now uh, uh, you know they tend to have uh, have less, have two or three. Okay, uh, the birth rates also decline. Uh, causing a drop in the um, rate of population growth. So by the time that the population has reached the um, industrial age, uh, population growth slows dramatically. Okay? More people move to cities. Um, the urban couples often choose to accumulate material goods instead of having large families. Um, so as you can see, uh, ZPG, the zero population growth, is reached in the uh, post-industrial uh, stages. Okay, so eventually, uh, birth rate will fall below the death rate, right? and you can you can see it here, uh, and and then uh, that means um, the population size will actually um, begin to decrease. Okay, so today um, the U.S., Canada, Australia, Japan, Russia, uh, most of the Western European uh, countries are in the industrial industrial age. Okay, uh, the growth rates of these countries are slowly decreasing. Uh, and in Germany, uh, hung Hungary, uh, and, and other European countries, um, birth rates are lower than, than, than death rates. Uh, and those populations are actually uh, are shrinking, okay? uh, indicating entries into the post-industrial uh, stages. Um, so uh, countries like Kenya, as we saw with the uh, population pyramid, uh, and other less industrialized countries, are in the transitional stage, okay? Uh, but they might not have enough skilled workers or enough capital um, to make the transition to the industrial stage at all, okay? So they might be uh, 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 staying in the transitional uh, uh, stage uh, for the foreseeable uh, future. So as a result, uh, many poorer nations may stay um, in this stage, in fact, for, um, for, for, for a very, very long time. Okay, um, and developing countries experience rapid population increase because they 
uh, experienced a decline in death rates. Uh, you can see the green bar here going down uh, associated with this transitional stage uh, without a decrease in the birth rate. OK, so uh, together, these two things, a uh, high birth rate and low death rates uh, really causes the uh, population growth uh, rates to be to be to be higher. Uh, and that corresponds to this um, logarithmic uh, phase uh, of population growth. So uh, is there a relationship between population size and life expectancy? Well, there isn't a precise correlation uh, that we can pinpoint okay uh, it's not always clear you know what's the cause and effect relationship uh, uh, um, and 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 as population grows larger uh, and with longer life expectancy um, there will be uh, fewer resources available per capita and uh, as we approach the carrying capacity uh, we mentioned that population size can actually drop drastically uh, and you know uh, as the population increase um, it's going to get uh, quite dense as well. So various um, uh, factors could negatively affect the uh, life expectancy of that population. So as we approach the carrying capacity, are we uh, going to be able to further uh, increase the carrying capacity, right? Maybe there is some, some kind of innovation that are coming on the way to further increase the food sources, right? <clears throat> so people are now more conscious about what they eat, right? Uh, uh, shifting to a plant-based diet, um, so we could uh, use less land for, uh, 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 for uh, you know, grow, growing animals and, and things like that. Uh, uh, and, you know, if we all switch to uh, eating plant-based uh, diets, um, then we can sustain um, a greater population. So if that's the trend um, that we're going to be following, uh, perhaps we can push the carrying capacity even higher uh, and uh, a human could continue to grow. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, or we talked about how uh, if we are unable to change the carrying capacity, then the population might stabilize and, and hover around the carrying capacity. Um, or it's also possible that we overshoot and, and go beyond the carrying capacity, uh, and then resources become extremely limited, uh, and that could lead to a population um, a crash. So, you know, we're not really sure, obviously, at this point, uh, uh, but um, uh, those are the possible outcomes uh, of the um, of the human population as as a whole. Okay, so uh, this is just an introdu introductory uh, lesson on the uh, on the course. Um, it, throughout the course, we are going to be uh, looking at various things that um, uh, humans w uh, are able to 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 develop, to innovate, to uh, uh, extend our life. Right. So in in the next two weeks, we'll be looking at uh, the um, use of vaccines uh, to uh, prevents virus causing illnesses uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, antibiotics um, and how it's able to help us uh, overcome uh, infectious disease uh, and um, later on in the course we'll also talk about uh, things like um, organ transplant um, the uh, use of biotechnology um, as well as uh, 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 you know when, when we get to an old age uh, what are some of the uh, limitations uh, that we still haven't been able to overcome, right? Things like uh, cancer, for example. Uh, and um, those are going to be um, topics that we'll be discussing uh, in, the, in, the, in the remaining of the course. Um, so thank you for watching this uh, first lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to send me an email and um, I'll be sure to, uh, to get back to you. Okay, thank you.